God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our liberator. Amen. So um, a heads up before I officially begin, uh, we're going to be doing a Bible study halfway through this sermon, and there are Bibles in your pews, so you should grab one right now. And if you don't have one near you, you should find one. Very good. And maybe you can share if you have someone sitting next to you and you only have one in your row, that's fine. All right. Thanks. So on Tuesday or Wednesday of last week, my news feed started filling up with pictures of some guy who I at first thought was a throwback rendition of Dumbledore. And all these people started sounding off about homophobia and a dynasty and on and on. And I was like, didn't we already go through this? Didn't the Harry Potter character come out as gay in 2007? Why is this news? I only watch sports on TV. I'd never heard of A&E. None of this was on my radar in any way. But as time went on, I realized I wasn't looking at a wizard. It was someone else. And apparently this guy had said some pretty nasty stuff in a GQ magazine interview. Gentleman's Quarterly. That guy is no gentleman. I don't know how he got an interview in the first place. So I didn't pay it much mind. Last week, it was the white Santa Claus, white Jesus fiasco on Fox News. This week, it's some reality TV guy hating on gays. There's something every week, right? But then I started paying pastoral attention when members of my church, my beloved flock, began showing signs of disturbance. Gay and straight and queer alike were noticing that people in their wider circles were actually listening to this guy and supporting him. And then it got worse. Then Christianity and the Constitution started coming into the conversation. Again, just like with Chick-fil-A a few years ago, the Bible this and the freedom of speech that, And people claiming persecution and then other people pushing back and saying consequence for your actions isn't persecution, it's called being an adult. And on and on and on. We have been here before. Koinonia was born almost three years ago. We've always been a mix of LGBTQ and straight. We planned it that way. The founding members and planners of this church were evenly split, two queers and two straight allies. We wanted this to be a place where people of faith could raise families, diverse families, blended families, divorced families, single families, mixed race families, poor families, rich families, all kinds of families. We wanted this to be a place where we moved beyond where most churches are, don't ask, don't tell, or mere tolerance. My dad started the Open and Affirming Task Force at the church I grew up in. I identify as a member of the LGBTQ community. TR grew up with a lesbian pastor and is one of the most loving embodiments of masculinity and tried and true allies there is. So we came here without any apologies, ready to do the work of radical love in Battle Creek, and we've been doing it alongside many of you ever since. But lately, I've been witnessing something new. A critical mass of people, not just the pastors, have begun showing up and sounding off in support of each other out there, in public. It started when our very own Andy joined up with BC Pride and opted for a non-discrimination ordinance here in Battle Creek. Y'all showed up and spoke out on that big time. And this week, I've seen more and more of the same. Allies asking how to help. Some 
not asking how to help, just going in and challenging ignorance on their own. Others of you, gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender identified, speaking out in sheer confidence of the goodness of your love and the full worth of your bodies. It's a beautiful sight. Keep asking myself this question, what's gotten us here? Why are more and more of you willing to loosen your tongues, to practice radical love unapologetically out loud? What's driving this behavior? And it hit me. We've fallen in love with each other. We've got enough folks in here, and we've been showing up long enough that we've truly fallen in love. And we are willing to do whatever it takes to make that love known and felt and seen and heard, not just in the sanctuary on Sundays, but in our homes and over meals together, at our kids' games and concerts, at weddings and baby showers, by providing assistance when one of us is in need, by showing up on political policy through flooding City Hall and rocking the vote. And we have fallen in love with each other enough that when somebody is messing with the families in here, we're ready to fight. Which isn't natural for many of you sweet, sweet, conflict-avoidant Midwesterners. God bless you. Many of you are such loving, compassionate, good-hearted, never-hurt-a-fly kind of people. And while I don't relate to that, I do just love you to pieces for it. <laughs> that good-heartedness becomes something to really contend with when someone is messing with the people you love. And I've watched you struggle this week, struggle to speak up, and to step out, struggle to challenge what's harmful, but you've done it, and I have to say, this California pastor loves you more than ever. One of my favorite books in the whole world, but one of my favorite theological books in particular, is this tiny little text by a Syracuse professor by the name of John Caputo. It's called On Religion, Thinking in Action. And the first chapter is, in my very little humble opinion, the best writing ever done on the human experience of religious life, which is why I quote it in my sermons all the time. Last time I used the book in one of my sermons, I had us reflect on that famous question from Augustine that Caputo dives deeply into, what do I love when I love my God? Right? So lots of people will say that they love God. What do you love? When you say you love your God, that's the question. Caputo says that religious life is the journey to answer that question. He goes on to say, love is not a bargain, but unconditional giving. It is not an investment, but a commitment, come what may. Lovers are people who exceed their duty, who look around for ways to do more than is required of them. This week, in response to some celebrity with small ideas and a big mouth, getting way too much attention from a bunch of other people with small ideas and big mouths, I saw you love what you love when you love your God. I saw a bunch of people who were willing to unconditionally give to one another, who were invested in each other, come what may. I saw people who exceeded their duty, who did more than what was required of them. And because I've been here since the beginning and I've known many of you before you knew each other, and because I've watched you come in here, find each other, show up for each other, and fall in love with each other, I know now what you all love when you love your God. You're loving each other. Part of what's up in our culture, kicked up by all this homophobic nonsense, is indeed the question of what it means to be loving as a person of Christian faith. 
which is nice for me as your preacher today because it just so happens that the fourth Sunday of Advent is all about love, too. There are still a bazillion people out there. It's really decreasing by the day, but it feels like a bazillion people out there who believe that family love is about form and not function. That it's about body parts and not passion. That it's about legalism and not the spirit of what's right. And just in case anyone thinks this struggle is new, let me take us back 2,000 years to a good man named Joe. In order to do this, we need to have a little bit of Bible study. Don't say I didn't warn you, so please pull out your Bibles. Open up to chapter 1 of Matthew, verse 18. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's the first one in the New Testament. So there are two specific moments I'm going to have us focus on here today. There are two times that God appears in a dream and speaks to Joseph. Actually, God doesn't appear. God sends an angel of the Lord to appear in a dream. And both times... The angel gives Joseph very specific instructions. So we're going to look at both of those instances side by side and then make some conclusions about what true family love looks like. Everybody say okay if you're with me. Okay. All right. So we're at chapter 1, 18, verse 18 and 19. Um, somebody read those verses for me. Andy, do it. Okay, good. Stop there. Um, so do you guys want to know what the biblical mandate was in response to women being found in Mary's condition? Let's go to Deuteronomy 22, verse 23. Now, I want you all to remember that um, Joseph didn't know that this baby in Mary's belly was from the Holy Spirit. So you can imagine where he thought that baby came from, yes? Yes. So, anybody get to Deuteronomy 22, verse 23 for me yet? Andrea, read it aloud. Okay, thank you. So, from this passage, we know that by law, by religious law, Joseph should have turned Mary into the proper Jewish authorities, and from there, she should have been stoned to death. Now, flip back to Matthew. Somebody read verse 19 for me again, just one time. So the Bible labels Joseph a what man? A righteous man. The Hebrew for that word righteous is dikaios, okay? And do you know what that means, literally? That word in Hebrew for righteous literally means one who follows the law. This is a paradox in our text. The man who is intending to break the law for Mary's sake is labeled righteous, which means follower of the law. That makes no sense. Go figure. Next, go to Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. Andrea, you want to read that one for me? Or you can just read 13. You don't have to go. Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much. So um, what's the central geography playing a big role in this story? Where's the place? 
Egypt, right. So um, you don't have to do this, but if you need to, just to fact check me, go back to Exodus, okay? Chapter 1, 8 through 14, but you don't really have to do that. Who knows what happened in Egypt to the Israelites? They were enslaved, that's right. So um, there are a few places in biblical history that have great symbolic and psychic power for the Israelite people, and Egypt is one of them, okay? Egypt is where the Israelite people were first in bondage. It was also the first place where God flexed liberation power and freed the people from slavery. So Egypt in the Hebrew scriptures then is a lot like Auschwitz is to the Jews today. It's a place of abject evil and cruelty, a place of intolerable suffering and pain, and that's where God tells Joseph to go. So let me make this plain. In Jesus' day, Herod was going to kill all the firstborns, which is what Pharaoh did in Egypt during Moses' day. And in order to protect Jesus from being slaughtered by Herod, God tells Joseph to go to Egypt. That makes no sense. Go figure. Neither of these stories make sense. Neither of these stories confirm to what's lawful or what's expected of a good believer. In both stories, God directs Joseph to do exactly the opposite of what we might expect. In one story, Joseph stays. He stays with Mary, who is by all evidence outside the law. And in one story, Joseph goes. He goes to a place that is forbidden. So what does this tell us about love? About the love that literally incarnates godly family. Joseph isn't the baby daddy. He chooses to parent Jesus. It's family by choice. And Lord knows what kind of son he raises, only the greatest human being that's ever graced this earth. Joseph chooses to stay with Mary in an arrangement that goes directly against biblical mandate, and he's labeled righteous by the Bible in so doing. Joseph is willing to brave the unknown, to do the impossible, to risk, to stay when necessary, to go when necessary, to love unconditionally, come what may, no matter what, do what it takes, especially when the stakes are high, go all out, no holding back. That's what makes for a loving parent. That's what makes for a loving partner. It ain't about body parts. It ain't about what the law says. It's about the spirit that says yes to God and yes to love no matter what, no matter how many times the world says no. It's about the spirit of love that conquers the impossible. I want to quote John Caputo one more time. The borders of the possible are safe but flat. Sure, but narrow. Well-defined, but confining. And they stake out the lines of an unsalted, mediocre life without a passionate hope where nothing really happens and all present systems do just fine. If at the end of our lives we find that all our hopes have been sensible and moderate and measured, if we have never been astir with the impossible, then we shall also find that on the whole, life has passed us by." End quote. There are some people in this culture who only know safe but flat. They only know family according to gender roles and genitals, and they are quacking so loud right now it's impossible not to hear them. God was not born into that kind of family. God was born into a family where friendship, joy, and beauty reigned supreme in the women, where rules were broken by men for the sake of justice, 
God was born into an entirely genderqueer arrangement. God was born into a community of stargazers and dreamers and folks who love to sing real loud. God was born into a community where ordinary, everyday citizens were called into courageous encounters with each other and were transformed by those encounters. They were made stronger, they were made more whole, rendered valuable, vulnerable and strong at the same time. Kind of like us. When we are that kind of family, that kind of community here at church, God is born in our midst. And you know what? When God is born into our midst, we will be called to speak truth to corrupt power. And thank you, those of you who have been doing that. But more than anything else, we will be called to be about that salty love. Love with flavor. Love that seems impossible but is actually the only thing worth living for. Love that breathes freely. Love that saves. Love that shines. We may have to break laws for that love. We may have to stay with each other when it's hard for that love. We may have to go places that scare us more than a little bit. We may have to go away from everything we've ever known. But when we do that love, that love like shining, there is no darkness, no darkness in all the world that can overcome it. Amen.